Thank you, Kazoo. Jules, thanks for joining us on the show tonight. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Mate, um, I'm, I'm keen to jump in and chat to you with you about a few different things, but, mate, everyone who's a Kings fan is just really concerned about how you're going with the, uh, with the injury, if you're looking good for um, the season, kicking it off, not only some round one, but also pre-season, because there's a lot of changes going on there at the Kings, and we'd, uh, we'd all like to know that you're going to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, huge changes at the Kings uh, this off-season. Everything from the management to most of the roster to the coaching staff. It's been a, it's been a hectic off season, but I've been lucky enough that the coaching staff and the management has really allowed me just to take my time, uh, rehabbing and getting healthy because they know we don't win the competition in uh, September, but we're going to be there come finals time in February. So I've just been going through the process now of rehabbing pretty much since the day I got my leg out of the brace. I've almost been in physio. Uh, three to four times a week. When I'm not in physio, I'm rehabbing on my own. And then uh, we start pre-season July 18th, it is. And I'll be I'll be amongst it, just doing all the non-contact stuff until uh, until our Rio boys get back and uh, Drewy gets back from uh, gets back from the Olympics doing the commentating stuff. So mid August, I hope to be back to full contact. Uh, for those that, that aren't keeping up, the ruptured right quadricep is the uh, is the injury we're talking about. And, mate, it was pretty hard to, to even take a bath or, or stand up or anything in a lot of times. Mate, tell me about how it was coping with that injury and, um, and I guess, a couple of opportunities that you missed as a result, perhaps. Yeah, um, I uh, well, when it first happened to me, uh, I went down and I, was, I had a bit of a yell and a bit of a carry-on. But um, I was laying there, and once the pain subsided after about 10 seconds, I kind of like, I tried to like move my, move my kneecap or move, and I couldn't really feel anything, but I felt like a sharp pain going up my leg. And I thought maybe I was just cramping. I was hoping I was just cramping. And it wasn't until they stood me up, and uh, I tried to put new weight on it, I knew there was something serious. And they took me back into the back room, and the physio did a few, uh, few different tests. And the main one was he just asked me to contract my kneecap and I couldn't do it. And, and he could see there was a, a little bit of a divot there where the tendon had actually come away from the bone itself. So it was a complete, yeah, it was a complete rupture of the tendon, which uh, required surgery. I was lucky enough that I got into surgery uh, two days later. And uh, it, was, it was six weeks of in a brace. And literally while I was in that brace, um, it was, I wasn't able to move. I wasn't able to get out of bed. I wasn't able to do anything. So a lot of the time, if I was at home by myself, it even entailed peeing into a bottle that was next to my bed. That's how, that's how serious it was. I wasn't even able to get out of bed. And then, uh, yeah, the rehabilitation started, and I thought, the, I thought the injury was painful, but the rehab, the first initial stages of rehab, trying to get any range of motion back into my knee was definitely excruciating. Am I right in, in saying that the guys, when Boga went down, gave you a call and, and was hoping that you'd be right to, to come to training? Yeah, that's it. Uh, that, was probably, that was more gut-wrenching than anything. When uh, I was pretty happy with the way my rehab had been going and I'd been crossing off all the, the things I needed to do in order to be ready for the season that I kind of put Rio to the back of my mind. I hadn't even thought about it. And uh, when I saw Boga go down, I thought automatically, oh, no, there's a problem here. Gone. I hope this guy's all right. I hope Bogut's all right. And it wasn't until the next day that um, that Lamanis gave me a phone call and asked me how the knee was actually going and asked me, uh, would I like to come in and be a part of camp? And it took me a second there, and I had to really debate in my mind, hey, Jules, can you do it? Can you push through? But I just wouldn't have been ready, and I wouldn't have been doing any, any favours to, to the coaching staff or the players. Mm, yeah, I mean, that's... That sucks big time. I know you were a part of the team in 2009. Um, what type of a role had you had with the team before going down? It was, was Rio a possibility? Well, when I was playing overseas and all my time overseas, uh, Andre had kept in pretty good contact. We probably spoke, I don't know, once or twice every season. And he would make sure he put time away and he was always checking on how I'm going and what my plans were. Because I was playing in Lebanon and I also had a Lebanese passport, the Lebanese national team was also wanting me to play for them. And, and I spoke to Andre about that, but he was saying that in his mind, as long as I was able to, I guess, like any other player, prove yourself that you're able to, to make the team, is that he, or he always saw a spot for me in that, uh, in that Rio team. And yeah, it was pretty gut-wrenching when I actually got the phone call from him and uh, asked me if I wanted to come into camp. 
and uh, then I had to say no to him. You never want to do that. No, no, no. Well, tell me about that because um, I was wondering like how close you actually did come to playing for the Lebanese things. I remember, I think that was around uh, 2014 or whatever when, yeah, there, I was reading uh, yeah, international news articles online about how you know Lebanon had teed you up to play in the 2016 Olympic Games. Yeah, they, um, they were, first of all, they wanted me to play for the, they have the trials, the, the Olympic trials. And they were really, really wanting me to play for them. Uh, there's not too many six, eleven, seven foot blokes walking around in Lebanon, so <laughs> they were very keen for me to be a part of that squad and a part of that team. Especially guys that can dribble the ball and chew gum at the same time, I'd imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then I, um, I always said to them that I would have to run it by Andre and the Australian team because that was my dream growing up. As a as an Australian, you want to represent your country. And so Andre always said to me, you're part of the plan for my Olympic squad. Um, so I always had to kind of let the Lebanese team down saying, uh, I, I want to represent Australia, but living in Lebanon and saying that you want to represent another nation is, is pretty tough, especially when they're seeing me and they feel like they're developing me. Why should Australia get to have that kind of reward? It's just the way it was, it was over there. But um, okay. yeah, but then when I when I signed my contract with Sydney, uh, Rio for Australia was definitely my number one priority. Mm, and, and I mean, we're on to it now. So let's have a chat about Lebanon because I, I know, um, I, I, I know it was pretty crazy over there. I know there was uh, it was even a little bit scary sometimes. So tell me about playing in Lebanon, what that was like, and um, and yeah, ultimately, I guess why it is that you left. Yeah, the. The Lebanese people really, really did actually go out of their way uh, to make me and my wife feel comfortable. Um, the team I was a part of, uh, they went above and beyond. The management there were really, really good to me. Uh, things that would normally take months, paperwork to process in order for me to get my passport, they went out of their way and they managed. They actually sent a lady from the Australian embassy. They paid for all her flights, all her accommodation, and she hand-delivered all the documentation that they needed uh, in order to get me my passport so I was able to make the cutoff date. So I was there for three years and things weren't too bad. Obviously in a country like that, at times things are a little bit volatile. And mm. you're, um, Explain that, like volatile. What, do you, what, what sort of things did you see that, that, that you know, sort of makes it volatile? Well, personally, my experience there, I never saw anything untoward. I was always safe, security around. But like anywhere, you read news articles of, certain things going on, there may be a bombing or there may be something like that. But myself personally, i never seen anything like that. Um, okay. Yeah, I think anywhere you go in Europe these days or the Middle East especially, there's always a sense of heightened security just going through airports and whatnot. They really do take it to a different level in order to ensure safety. So I didn't really, I didn't have any any real close calls or anything like that. The, the team was really good. They put me in nice apartments, nice hotels. They really did make sure that I was safe. The only reason that I did leave Lebanon when I did was um, the management at the time were re- really struggling for money. Uh, they'd been, we probably hadn't been paid for about three months or something, like, which is pretty pretty normal in Europe. If you ask the most guys who have gone and played in Europe, the pay always does come pretty late. But talking to my agent, uh, we thought that maybe we weren't sure if the club was going to be able to even secure the money at all. So we made a kind of judgment call at the time that it was the best time for me to leave and try and come back to Sydney and start playing with the Kings again. You've got a, a background, a Lebanese background there with your dad, but was that something that you were very close to, that, that, that culture before heading over there? And then what was it like uh, immersing yourself in that? Yeah, well, my father passed when I was very young. So I was only six or seven years old, something like that. Um, so I never really grew up with much of a Lebanese heritage or... Uh, a Lebanese background. I didn't know too much about it. Uh, my mother was born and raised in Australia, so we were all, we all, we all brought up normal Aussie kids. Um, but it wasn't until I started playing basketball and started going over to Europe for the first time when I was in Holland that I really started getting Facebook messages, text messages. My agent was getting phone calls saying, Julian Kazoo, Kazoo's a traditional Lebanese name. Has he ever thought about playing in, uh, in Lebanon? And I always never thought, never took it seriously because I never really considered playing in Lebanon. 
Yeah, because what's the competition like over there compared to the NBL? Uh, I'd say the top four teams in Lebanon uh, are NBL standard for the sheer fact that yeah. they recruit their foreigners, their imports, out of very, very good leagues. Um, the money they have over there for their rec- for their foreigners is, is huge. So the top four teams really do recruit well, and it's usually after the China season finishes, the CBA. Oh, and yeah. Those guys, yeah, so the top guys playing in the CBA will usually come over to Lebanon and finish the season off there. And, and so, uh, Sagese, is, is that, um, I think I'm pronouncing it right, but, but you, you know better than I do. Are they, are they one of the teams that were in the top four? Or? Yes, so yes, yeah, we were top two. Every year that I was there, we were a top two team. Um, yeah, so we, we, we recruited a player one year called Quincy Doobie, who was the, was the leading scorer in China that same year. And he came over for something ridiculous, like $300,000 a month or something like that. Wow. So, yeah, so that's the kind of, the, the year after that, we had a, a seven-foot guy called Chris Daniels who played like a point guard. We, we really did have some good foreigners on our team. Okay. Because I, I, I thought I heard something about uh, it was hard to get out of the country in, in some aspects. Is, is that, was I right in saying that? Yeah, yeah, it was hard for the, for the way that, um, I guess, because I had decided to leave the team before the season had finished, uh, I was leaving at an odd time and living on such a small country that everyone knew who I was because basketball is a national sport there. So they were, when I was walking through the airport and stuff, I just had to make sure that I was quiet, try to keep my head down as much as possible, uh, just to draw, not to draw any attention to myself because the last thing I wanted to do was have all the players and coaches and that calling me up wondering what I had done because it wasn't really the players or the coaches' fault. It was the management and their not being able to get paychecks on time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, I think I read somewhere that you, it was midnight or late at night where you had to sneak out to get to the airport or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, my my flight was at six a.m. or my oh, flight wow. was at eight a.m. Yeah, so I uh, left the ho- I had to leave my hotel um, in the middle of the night just so that the hotel security and, and stuff wouldn't uh, relay that why is Julian leaving with all these bags in the middle of the night? So. I kind of did it at a time where everything was real quiet and I went and sat in the airport. I think I got to the airport at like 1 a.m. and I just went and sat in the corner for about five hours or six hours and just sat there with my head down, headphones on, just trying <laughs> to be as ridiculous as possible. Yeah. Were you, like, what were you feeling at the time? Like scared or, or were you just confident in the guys that were leading you out of there? Or? You know, I wasn't, I, wasn't too, I wasn't too worried at all. I knew if anything did come back, the coaching staff kind of supported me in my decisions. Um, it's funny the way that it worked over there is that they were ju- they weren't getting paid either, so they were mad at management as well. It's uh-huh. just that because I was I was like I was one of the the few who had dual nationality that I was able to leave, and a lot of the guys are still playing for the same team and paychecks constantly coming in late. So I just wasn't sure if the money was ever going to come. And usually, if you leave a team at the end of the year, that you'd never hear from them again. That happened in previous years that I had played in Holland and whatnot. That yeah. they promise you your last two checks, and then when you hit Australia, when you get back to Australia and you try to get in contact with them, all of a sudden, the, no one's picking up the phones anymore. Mm, mm, crazy, crazy. 